Chapter Two of Night of Molokai by Eva K. Betts. Skating was the most popular sport in Nind. This was the name of the small village in the Belgian district of Tremelou, on whose edge the De Wooster farm was situated. Two little streams, the Deemer and the Loch, joined just above the town to form the River Dial, and in one of its sheltered spaces, the children of Tremelou, and their elders too, when time permitted spent every possible moment during the winter skating and playing on the ice. Races and ice sports of all kinds were popular, and Joseph de Wooster's sturdy legs and arms and strong will made him a star, even among boys and girls who had learned to skate almost as soon as they walked. He often competed with boys much older than he, and even when out distance by lads with longer legs and stronger muscles, he'd keep right on skating just as hard as he could. If he started out to skate a certain distance at his best possible speed, he'd do it regardless of what speed anyone else might make. You never know when you're beaten, the other boys teased. Oh, yes, I do, Joseph would answer airily. But I'm not going to quit just because I can't win every time. I went four times around just as fast as I could, which is what we agreed on. But the others were finished when you were only half around the last lap, protested the others. So they were, agreed Joseph. They were faster than I, now, but maybe some day I'll win. Contentedly, he took off his skates and went home to the brick house where his chores awaited him. The next day, the sun shone brightly, flashing along the blades of skates that swung from the boys' shoulders on their way to school. Each young student also carried a bag made of waxed cloth, containing his school books and carefully wrapped in a clean napkin, some sandwiches which with the apples nestling at the bottom of the bag, would make up the noonday meal. But Joseph's mind was occupied neither with books nor with lunch. He had spent all the previous evening shining and sharpening his skates. Today he was going to really skate, faster than he had ever skated before, faster perhaps than even the big boys, whose long, powerful legs had so often outdistanced his shorter ones. The forenoon dragged for Joseph. Frequently the teacher reprimanded him for staring at the sunlit outdoors when his eyes should have been on his book. Frequently the master had to pull the boy's mind back from the river where he was picturing himself skating so fast that it was like flying. Noon came and the boy stampeded outdoors to a sheltered space at the corner of the building. Here, out of the wind, they squatted or stood to eat their home-packed lunches and have their talks. Say, that sun is hot, exclaimed one of them. I hope it doesn't melt the ice and make it slushy. Oh, it won't do that, Joseph spoke confidently. The skating just had to be good, for today, he was sure, was to be his day. The afternoon session seemed to him at least twice as long as the long forenoon, but at last, when he had almost given up hope that such a thing would happen, it came to an end. Like one great, multi-legged animal, the boys poured out of the schoolyard and down to the river. In an instant, it seemed all had their skates on and were swooping and gliding over the ice. Joseph's freshly sharpened skates bit into the smooth surface, and his legs, which seemed to him to have twice their usual strength, thrust like powerful pistons driving him forward with ever-increasing speed. A warm feeling of assurance filled him. Let's race three times around, he yelled to a big boy near him. Together they struck out to circle the little cove in which much of their skating was done. The older boy hung back a bit at first to give Joseph a small head start, but before they were once around, he began to regret the gesture. He was finding it very hard to make up the lead he had permitted. On the second lap, he drew up beside the flying Joseph, but that was the best he could do. Try as he would, exerting himself to the limit, he still could not forge ahead, and he was supposed to be the champion skater of Tremelou. By the time they had begun their third circling of the cove, the other boys were aware of what was going on, and all drew to one side to watch what they now realized for the first time was a real contest. Hurry, Joseph, hurry! He's pulling ahead. Don't let him get the lead. Faster! You can do it! Joseph's classmates were nearly wild with excitement. What a day it would be if one of the younger boys beat Henry, who usually could outskate any boy on the river. Don't let a small kid beat you, Henry. You can outskate him any day. The older boy screamed at the champion. But in spite of their faith in him, 
in spite of his best efforts, the end of the third lap was in sight, and Henry could not pull into the lead. Worse, he was tiring, while Joseph seemed to be as fresh as when the race started. It looked as if there would soon be a new champion in Tremolo. A few yards from the finish line, Joseph's skate struck a tiny reed frozen into the ice, and he tottered for a moment. He regained his balance without falling. That moment's slow-up gave Henry the chance to use the end of his strength in one last burst of speed and pull ahead, the tired victor, in a race which had surprised him as much as it did those watching. Joseph swallowed his disappointment and waved a congratulation as he flashed by. You win this time. Now let's skate out on the river for a while. Without pausing for an answer, he swung away from the shaded, shallow cove and headed out toward the main body of the river. The feeling of defeat had vanished. His heart was singing. This was how the gray gulls must feel as they soared over the water. The skating seemed effortless to him as his keen blade shot over the ice sparkling in the sunshine. There was a yell from the boys behind him, but he made no effort to understand what they were saying. They probably wanted him to come back and try another race, but he was happy where he was and didn't even turn. They yelled again, but the wind, strong now that he was out of the shelter of the cove, carried their words away. Left, right, left, right, his skates hissed as they cut into the ice. From the cove, far behind him now, came another yell. They were certainly anxious to tell him something. Well, he'd find out what it was when he got back. He couldn't be bothered now. It was strange, he thought, as he sped along, to realize that below him were fishes. Did they swim around and hunt for food, he wondered? Was it completely dark under the roof of ice, or did some light from the bright sun filter through? He tried to picture the half-lit world, weeds still moving in, running water, fishes darting in and out among them. It must be very cold down there, he said to himself. If a person were in that water, he probably wouldn't last very long. His muscles would freeze so he couldn't swim or try to save himself. It's fortunate that a fish's blood is different from that of people. The good Lord looks after his creatures. By now he was far out in the river. The shouts of his companions had faded completely, or they had tired of calling to him, perhaps. He didn't know which, and really didn't care, for he was enjoying himself completely. Left, right, left, right. His skates seemed to have strength and a will of their own, as they flashed in the sun. There were no other skate tracks where he was now. No one had been out this far since the last freeze. He looked down at the glistening white sheet and saw, to his horror, that just a few yards in front of him, the whiteness stopped sharply and was replaced by a soft, mushy-looking gray. The sun, or an underwater spring, had melted the ice. He couldn't possibly stop his forward flight before reaching the danger spot. He had just a fleeting instant of panic. Then lifting his right foot, he swung it with all the force he possessed, across to the left side of his body, rising at the same time to the tip of his left skate. The ice flew out in a feathery spray as the left skate bit in, but he jerked the blade out of the ice, wheeled, and struck back quickly for the cove, where his friends, who had tried to warn him of the danger, were straining terror-stricken eyes in his direction but he had taken no more than three or four strokes on safe ice when he stopped and fell on his knees. Thank you, Heavenly Father, he cried, for giving me a guardian, and thank you, dear angel, for making me look down in time. I'm sorry to give you so much work to do, he added ruefully. If it hadn't been for you, pride would have gone before a drowning, or at least a drenching, that time. Joseph practiced his skating daily during the rest of the winter, he felt sure that by next year, when the time came for the competition between the skaters from the Hamlets and Tremolo, he would be ready to enter the contest. And each time he skated, he had a vivid picture of the immersion and possible drowning in icy waters from which he had been saved. When spring came, he had cause to thank his guardian angel once again. Constant skating had made his legs very strong, and he became one of the fastest runners in the schoolyard. So the children invented a game to play on their way home from school at the end of the day. With their school bags slung over their shoulders, the boys and girls who lived near Joseph would line up hand in hand with Joseph in the middle. They would spread out across the road and start running, each doing the best he could. The little ones at the end of the row would tire first, 
their older brothers and sisters soon after. But Joseph would keep pounding along, tugging the laughing, stumbling children in his wake. This V of Mary's shouting youngsters was careening down the road one afternoon, squealing with the particular excitement they always felt when they came to a sharp curve that was very hard to negotiate. Joseph speeded up a trifle and gave an extra tug with his left arm to haul those children who had to run the wider arc. They swung around the blind corner, only to see facing them, almost on top of them, a team of galloping horses, driven by a farmer in a hurry to reach his home. He was driving much too fast, it is true, approaching this bad turn, but on the other hand, he could not have expected to find the highway filled by a flying wedge of boys and girls. Frightened, he hauled up his reins. The bit tore at the horse's mouth, but the rushing animals could not stop in time. It seemed that there must be carnage on the road. But Joseph, thinking quickly, stiffened his arms and pushed. Boys and girls tumbled into the ditches on either side of the road. Joseph was alone on the highway with no time to jump either to right or left. The wagon thundered past lurched dizzily around the corner, and came to a stop a few yards beyond. The shaken driver climbed down and walked back around the curve, thinking sickly of the crushed and broken body he would find. He would have to bring the child, probably dead, but surely maimed, back to his parents. Trembling, he turned the corner. The child was in the road, on his knees. A bump on his head was swelling rapidly, and a torn shirt showed that his shoulder was cut and bruised. I'm thanking my guardian angel, said Joseph, as the farmer drew near. I got bumped when I fell, but my guardian must have rolled me in between the two horses. The farmer gulped, hardly daring to believe that his dreadful fears were proving to be baseless. He stood Joseph on his feet and felt his every bone and joint. Surely the boy could not have escaped without injury. How was it possible that he had missed being struck by the eight iron-shot hooves or crushed by the heavy wheels? Yet that seemed to be the case. My guardian angel, sir, explained Joseph again, wincing a little as the farmer's big hands touched his bruised shoulders. My angel guardian took care of me. The farmer glared for a moment, angry at the cause of the overwhelming fright he had suffered. Then Joseph's earnest solemnity softened him. You need two guardian angels to keep you out of trouble, I think, he said. Get into the wagon. I'll drive you home and explain your torn clothes to your mother. End of Chapter 2 Recording by Maria Therese